One of the takeaways of being a programmer is it makes you smart because it forces you to break down a problem and formulate a solution. One expert defines programming as instructing the most stupid thing in the universe, the computer, what to do. In face of such adversity, what would you do? You must make your instruction as clear, as step by step, as bit by bit as possible. That's what it means to think algorithmically. And then, to talk to the computer and get the computer do something for you. But before that, one of the questions we can ask, so what is the computer going to do for us? This seems like probably an odd question. After all, we know computer can do a lot of things. We use the computer for communication, playing, curing diseases, exploring the outer space, and the like. But it's important to go back to a very fundamentals and basic points. Fundamentally, computers do two things only. Perform calculations and remember the results to reuse it. If you haven't already noticed, the root of the word computer is compute, thus calculation. So what kind of calculation? Well, computer comes with a simple set of built-in primitive calculations. It's the basic elements of computer can use provided by the manufacturer. Examples are evaluating an expression that includes addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication and logic like greater than and less than, some simple tests, and assigning a value to a variable to move data. This primitive doesn't do much, so a key thing is to learn how we can create our methods for creating something. Our computer are going to do calculation by using a set of built-in primitives plus things that we add. In short, a working program that enhances the capability of computer. The next question is, is the computer with a simple calculation or operation enough? You might answer yes, because computer is very fast. Let's look at both parts of that. First of all, how quickly does a modern computer run? Let's make a historical comparison. In year 1940, Alan Turing and others took years to crack a code of Enigma machine used by the Nazis to encrypt their correspondence in World War II. In late 2007, at the Imperial War Museum in London, developers applied modern artificial intelligence to crack the code within 11 minutes. The unit of measurement of the central processing unit is called Hertz, which is technically one cycle per second, and roughly saying one instruction per second. Modern processors often run so fast that gigahertz is used instead. One gigahertz is one billion cycles per second. By the time of writing, average computer has a speed of 3.6 gigahertz. If you do the math, you may realize that's a lot of computation per second. Now, that suggests that in fact, computers are incredibly fast. That's amazing! Even though they are computing very simple things, they're doing incredibly quickly. We also said that they have some storage. So how big is the storage inside the computer? The smallest unit of storage measurement in the computer is called byte. One byte corresponds to one letter or a number. If you put that to perspective, the phrase, I love you, is 10 bytes of data. A 300 words short essay can fit to two kilobytes. That final edition of Encyclopedia Britannica consists of 32 volumes, weigh nearly 130 pounds, 
and contains approximately 500 words and 3 million characters, it requires roughly 1 gigabyte of disk space to store the entire text of that final volume. The largest library in the world, the Library of Congress, which houses 26 million books in the collection, was 10 terabytes. You only require 10 hard drives to store all information in the Library of Congress. As a bonus, Twitter needs just 20 terabytes to back up every tweet that ever existed. So, that sounds really good. The computer is fast and has a lot of memory. The question is, if their only primitive operation, is that enough? Let me give you a simple example. Playing chess is something that seen as a very difficult task. But it's amazing that in May 1997, an IBM supercomputer known as Deep Blue beat the chess world champion Gary Kasparov. And one of the question is, well, is it just because the computer is really fast? Well, we can look at this two ways. In the typical chess game, there are 35 moves at any one time. And so the question you could ask is to say, if I want to have my computer program, look ahead six moves, three moves by me, three moves by my opponent, how many options are there if there are about 35 moves each? And the answer is about 1 billion different sets of chessboard 1 billion different sets of chessboard that I'd like to look at. If I can check each move out in about 100 operations per move, then that says it's going to take me about half hour to actually look at each move. That's pretty slow. And the problem is that, yes, computers are really fast, but we need a good algorithmic design as well. And we're going to discuss that in this course. Now, we want to think algorithmically. Let's start by asking the question, what is knowledge? As we're going to see, we can divide knowledge up to two parts. There's declarative knowledge, which we can think of a statement of facts. And there's imperative knowledge, or how-to's method. Statement of the facts give us true, but as we'll see, they don't necessarily help us think about how to find new informations. Imperative knowledge, how-to methods or recipes give us ways on finding new information and that's going to be really valuable for us. Now to look at this, let's look at an example. What do we mean by declarative knowledge? Well, here's a piece of declarative knowledge. That first statement says, the square root of a number x is a number y such y times y equals x. You know that's true from your math class. It's a statement of truth. If we have a number x equal to 25 and we're trying to find the square root of that and somebody gives us a guess, y equals 5, we can use this statement to test to see if 5 times 5 equals 25, which it does. It tells us something about how to decide whether a particular number is a square root or not. But can we use this to actually find a square root? And the answer is no. It gives us the formula, but it doesn't tell us how to find the guess. So declarative knowledge, which is what much of knowledge is based on, isn't what we need. We want a different kind of knowledge. And for that, fortunately, we have imperative knowledge. As we said, imperative knowledge is how two kinds of knowledge. Our methods or recipe for finding something. And here's a recipe for deducing square root. And you can see the description here. Description says, if you want to find the square root of some number x, we're going to start with a guess. Let's call it g. We're going to take g and multiply it by itself and look if that result is close enough to x. If it is, we're going to stop and say that g is the answer. 
Otherwise, I'm going to make a new guess by averaging g and x over g. And using this new guess, which we will call g again, I'm going to repeat the process until we get something that's close enough. Notice this is a set of steps and it has some basic forms. Right here, there's a test. It's going to tell us when we're done, when we're close enough. If the test isn't satisfied, some calculation like here that tells us what to do. And then finally, there's a flow of control or a loop that tells us how to keep executing the same sequence of operation until we get, in fact, to place where we were done. This is something that tells us how to find the square root. This is imperative knowledge and this is what we want. Okay, let's try this out. We want to find the square root of 25. And yeah, I know that the answer is 5. But let's think about what may happen here. I'm going to start with the guest and I'm going to initially guess 3. Herons of Alexandria's algorithm says multiply 3 by itself. That, of course, gives us 9. Is 9 close enough to 25? I don't think so. So let's get x divided by g, which is 8.33. And now, let's take the average of x over g and g. So we add g and x over g takes the average of that and we get 5.67. And then our little recipe says that take that and do it again. So this now becomes the new guess 5.67. I multiply those together, I happen to know that comes out to be 32.5. I've gotten closer to 25. But it aren't there yet. Again, let's take x divided by this g, which turns out to be about 4.41. And then I take g and x times g and I average them, I get 5.04. Multiplied by itself is about 25.4. And I'm going to say that's close enough. So my little recipe says. There's the answer. Not perfect, but close enough. So we can think of algorithm as being recipes. Sequence of steps of doing something. We can see that algorithm have much of the same form as our real recipe.